morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord. What a blessing to have each and every one of you here today. Uh, boy, I wanted to just call you by name, but some of you I have met for the very first time. What a blessing to have you here today at Lake Martin Baptist Church. We just pray that the services will be a blessing to you this morning. That's certainly what we want to do. We want to minister to you and be a blessing to you. And uh, we just pray that the services today would just be the richest blessing to you and your family. If you are visiting with us for the first time, hope that you will remember this at the end of the service as you make your way uh, out of the fellowship or the sanctuary, rather. Or you'll notice a welcome desk right in the middle. There's some blue bags there. These are welcome bags, and it just has a little gift, a little information about the church, and hope that you'll take that and receive that, and uh, it'll remind you to pray for us and uh, give you a little information again about the church. Uh, let me say one other thing before I go through other announcements. Um, it's kind of come to our attention that there are some churches that are dealing with COVID-type things. Uh, just over the last few days, we've become aware of that, and we want to continue to just be vigilant about that. And at the same time, I don't know about you, but I surely want to go on about life and about living life and having the balance in these things. And so... I would say this, uh, just be sensitive to your neighbor. Uh, be sensitive to brothers and sisters in Christ. And so uh, what I try to do is wait for the other person's initiation. Some people will be handshakers and others will be elbow bumpers and uh, those kinds of things. And then some will just, just wave and feel comfortable with that. And, and just I would just say there's room for all of that in the body of Christ. And uh, we will just want to continue to, to show a warm welcome uh, to each and every person that is here, because I can assure you that it is a blessing uh, to have all of you here today. I want to mention several things just by way of announcement. Some things that are activities that are going on, of course, a teen fellowship tonight will be at Nikki Johnson's house, and you can see Miss Nikki about uh, any details about that. I want you to make you aware of that. And uh, then we have, uh, have had some folks who have indicated interest in t-shirts. This is there's two different types of t-shirts that uh, they're going to be putting on order pretty soon. One is the blue Lake Martin Baptist Church with a church logo on it. There's a sign-up sheet for that. The other is the Mary Makers t-shirt, and this has to do with our, our uh, senior group who goes out, and it doesn't have to be senior. It can be anybody, I think. I think they'd welcome regardless of the age. But uh, when we go out various activities and go to places and, and do things like that, uh, folks like to have t-shirts that have uh, some information about our church and uh, so uh, either one of those both of those uh, sign-up sheets are uh, in uh, the welcome desk or on the welcome desk as I should mention this as well they're going to have a kitchen cleaning party tomorrow about 10 a.m. and uh, again want to say a great thank you to Alan Michelle Dial and and Wes and Inga and all the folks on the Building and Grounds Committee that have done a great job of the new kitchen renovations. And uh, we, we hope to see that in full working order and, and in full use very soon. But after the work that has been done, they, they're talking about that it needs a good spring cleaning. I guess it'd be a summer cleaning now. So they'll be doing that tomorrow at 10. And so you're welcome to come and be a part of that. Uh, you'll see also in your announcement that uh, the Merrymakers will be going on a trip just to Alex City, to the far region of Alex City, uh, to go see a Gold City Quartet and another quartet as well, and the Kingsmen, I think. And I just wanted to make mention that. And then the ladies' group, the women's ministry, will be going to see Priscilla Shirer, and this will be September the 11th, which is still a ways away, but they have tickets for that and uh, uh, are course trying to get together that group about that you can see Miss Pam May about that now Pam and Joey of course are not here this morning uh, because uh, Miss Pam has been experiencing some trouble with a sciatic nerve and and then they had a stomach bug in their house with the grandchildren and they decided to shelter in place and I say praise the Lord and thank you very much and so but uh, I know they were most likely watching online and so pray for these and uh, others that uh, of course on our prayer list and uh, one other thing maybe is that the brotherhood will be meeting 
uh, for breakfast Tuesday, July the 13th at 8 a.m. at Jack's. I wanted to mention this. And then the card, the card that is in the back of the pew in front of you. This is a multi-purpose card. First of all, it's a visitor card. If you're visiting with us, we ask you to just fill that information out. I promise you, it will not bother you in any way, but we certainly want to acknowledge your visit. And uh, as we always say, it helps us to get to know you better. It helps us to put a name with a face, and if you'll fill that information out, it will be a blessing to us. Well, we cannot overemphasize that. But also, this serves not only as a visitor card, it serves as a prayer card. This goes for everyone that is here, and again, we just encourage you, if you have a prayer request, something that you would like to share with us that we could join with you in prayer about, it would be a great honor and a privilege to do that. And so you write those prayer requests down on that card, and then after the service this morning, on your way out, the offering plates are out there, and uh, just place that in the offering plate. And then the last thing, it becomes a decision card. If you're in the message this morning, or maybe even prior to the message, the Holy Spirit might have been dealing with you this week. He might have been speaking to you in a special way this week. And uh, that sort of brings it to a culmination here this morning. And uh, that decision card is a way of expressing that the Lord is doing something in your life, and maybe you'd like to have some help with that. And uh, we certainly want to minister to you in any way. And uh, just let us know how we can be a help to you and how we can be a blessing to you. We'll count it a great honor and privilege to do that. Fill that out on the decision card, again, visitor card, prayer card, and place it in the offering plate at the end of the service. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now and ask him to bless the remainder of our time together today. Father God, thank you again for the great privilege that is ours to be able to be in the house and to be with your people. And uh, we just thank you for the house of God. We thank you for the people of God. And we thank you for the church that is the body of Christ. We ask that you would bless now, Lord, with uh, the many names that come to our heart and to our mind, people who have various needs, physical needs, emotional needs, and otherwise, and unspoken requests. Lord, we pray for these needs. But now, Lord, we just commit the remainder of this service to you. And we ask that you would work in this service today. Have your way in the service. Have your way in each and every heart, each and every life, and each and every home. May Jesus be exalted today. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We are going to stand and sing our Wave him this morning, and like Brother Roger said, you know, you can, you can wave, bump elbows, or, or whatever you need to do, whatever you feel comfortable with. We're going to sing the, the, the song one time through, The Family of God, and then we're going to give you a wave time, then we're going to sing the, the whole song again. today. We we're, we're, don't have a choir special this morning. I told Brother Roger I'm giving him almost four minutes extra to preach this morning. And if you've never heard him preach before, I know we have some visitors today. He's in my top five of one of the best preachers that I've ever heard. He'll shake his head, 
But when I first started visiting here, I told, told my husband, I said, we just got to come hear him preach. You know, great. But we're going to give him some extra time this morning, so you better watch out. But, but uh, the, we're having choir practice today, and we're having Jake's famous blueberry puffs, which is one of my favorites while he keeps making those because I love them. If you have never had them, you need to come sing just to eat the blueberry puffs. But that will be at 5 o'clock today. And uh, the hymns we're going to sing this morning, going to do the little hymn medley. We've got one from 1793 paired with one from 2001. And you know they're going to do that in heaven, don't you? They're going to sing the old songs with the new. But, you know, interesting enough about the hymns, Holy, Holy, Holy was written by a young genius, wealthy, wealthy, educated family. But he was one of those guys that that graduated from college by the time he was 20 and he, and he attended Oxford. But he wrote 57 hymns during his lifetime. You know, God chooses everybody. You know, he became a pastor with all that genius that he had. He became a pastor, then he became a missionary, and he died early because he, he, worked, he went to India to be a, a missionary and, and worked very hard. But he wrote that song, and then a couple of young guys wrote the next song, In Christ Alone, which is beautiful too. So we're going to sing the first and fourth verses of Holy, 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 and we're going straight into In Christ Alone.
Amen. Thank you, Beth and Nancy and Bob. Thank you again for sharing in song this morning. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. And again, I would say what a, what a good-looking group this morning. We just appreciate each and every one of you being here today in the house of God. We pray that the service this morning will be a blessing to you. As Beth talked this morning a little bit, it made me wonder if we were having a guest speaker today. We had to be having a guest speaker. I'm confident of this, that uh, anything that happens that is of eternal value will be a work of the Lord. It'll be a work of the Spirit of God, and uh, He is the one that we're looking to today. So Romans chapter 8, we have been in a series of messages entitled The Irreplaceable Friend. Who are we talking about? When we use such a term, the irreplaceable friend, the irreplaceable friend is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. He is one called alongside to help. He is the one that Jesus promised in John chapter 14 through 16 that would come and that would minister to believers. He would be uh, the one who would guide. He would be the one who would illuminate. He would be the one who would bring things to our remembrance. He would be the one who would bring about spiritual conviction. He's the one that would baptize believers into the body of Christ. He is the one that will bring about spiritual transformation. And so what we've done is we've tried over these past several weeks to follow a phrase uh, that we've noticed and observed in the New Testament. And the phrase is this, in the Spirit. What we found as the Word of God is said to us, said to believers, that we ought to have various activities, that's putting it a little bit lightly, as believers in the Spirit. What kinds of things should we be doing in the Spirit? Well, the Bible tells us we ought to walk in the Spirit. The Bible tells us that we ought to worship in the Spirit, that we ought to pray in the Spirit, that we ought to live in the Spirit. Well, these these references alone make it pretty clear that it is all-encompassing in the Christian life, that our activities as believers ought to be in the Spirit. But what does that mean? Sometimes when we think about such activity, about walking and worshiping and praying and living in the Spirit, we have the idea of a connection with some kind of emotional or perhaps euphoric experience. And certainly I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for mountaintop experiences with the Lord and with that journey with the Lord. But I would say that someone could be very well uh, anointed by the Spirit and in the Spirit when they're in a difficult place. In fact, we think about we think about the Apostle John who was on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote, when God used him to write the book of the Revelation and yet there he was and he was in the Spirit. And so it's not always a mountaintop experience, maybe, that uh, is, defines, or rather defines, what it means to be living in the Spirit. No, hopefully as we look this morning again in Romans chapter 8, it'll become clearer to us about the importance of living in the Spirit and understanding the importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Let's read our text for this morning, which is Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. Paul said, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's stop there and pray together and ask the Lord to bless now the remainder of our time together today. Father God, thank you again for the privilege that is ours to be able to be in your house and to be with your people. And we thank you so much for the 
wonderful Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. We ask you to just have your way in the service today. Have your way in each and every heart, each and every home, and each and every life. And help us to see, Lord, the application of your word uh, to our lives. We ask that you'd give us good recall concerning your word, clarity of thought, and good understanding. We ask in that name which is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The Holy Spirit, the irreplaceable friend. There's no substitute for the Holy Spirit. Morality is not a substitute. Even good morality is not a substitute for the Holy Spirit. A religion is not a, hub, a substitute for the Holy Spirit. All that the Holy Spirit can do, all that the Holy Spirit desires to do, all that the Holy Spirit uh, will do, so critical and so important in the Christian life. How important? So much so we've made this statement that you cannot live the Christian life that God intends for you to live without the help and the ministry and the assistance Yes, even the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You cannot live the, the life that God has for you, intends for you, without the help and the assistance of the Holy Spirit. This morning, what we want to talk about, however, in sort of bringing this to the conclusion, we'll talk some more about this tonight, but this morning we want to talk about the fact that there is no replacement for the fellowship of the Spirit. No replacement for the fellowship of the Spirit. And to demonstrate that, our life, we want to see what the text of the Word of God has to say and make some observations. Number one, consider the importance of the Holy Spirit in bringing forth new life. Consider the, the importance of the Holy Spirit in bringing forth new life. As we consider how important the fellowship of the Spirit is, what does it mean to be alive spiritually? You remember that Jesus said, in John 10, 10, that it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I've come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. Now, that's a pretty easy choice, isn't it? On one side, there's death. And to be victimized and to become vulnerable to the thief who, of course, is Satan. The prince of the power of the air. And on the other side is Jesus saying, I am come that you might have life. It is his desire that we have life, and he said, life more abundantly. What is this spiritual life that he's talking about, that scripture talks about? Well, consider for a moment that there really are, there really is, three fundamental levels of spiritual existence. And these levels are indicated in this passage in Romans chapter 8. The first level, of course, is the level of someone who does not have the Holy Spirit. And yet the Bible says very clearly in Romans chapter 8, if you do not have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not a child of God. You're not a Christian and a believer. Notice chapter 8 again and verse 9, the latter part of verse 9, and this is what it says. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. How, how straightforward and how clear, abundantly clear that is. What are the consequences of that? Not belonging to Christ. What's the consequence of that? Well, Romans 8 verse 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the strong implication, and that's not even putting it strong enough, but the clear indication is this, that if uh, you're not in Christ Jesus, then the condemnation remains. Jesus put it another way in Matthew chapter 7. He said, In that day, talking about the day of judgment, Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, in your name cast out devils, in your name done many marvelous works. Now these people who are going to say this are good people, moral people, religious people, involved people. And yet Jesus gave this stern warning, this sober warning to say that many will come thinking they're ready to enter into the portals of heaven and he will say to them, depart from me that you, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. How important it is to be in Christ. How important it is to belong to Him. The Bible indicates it this way, puts it to us this way. Having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. How important that is to have heaven as your home. 
Oh, my friend, in all of the uncertainties of life and in the day, the world, and the culture that we live in with so much uncertainty, and it, it seems to escalate every day, the uncertainties of this world, the uncertainty of this country, quite honestly, the division, the conflict that is there. And yet in great, incredible contrast to that is the certainty that is in Christ and in Christ alone. We just sang about it. In Christ alone, there is no other name by which men can be saved. It is Christ and Christ alone. And yet the text of Scripture here says, if you have not the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 and verse 9. Now, if, you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So that's one level of spiritual existence. It is someone who does not have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, someone who is not in Christ. Therefore, someone who is lost. And can I say to you today, if you hear these words, if you hear these words for the very first time, what it, that is a demonstration of is that the Holy Spirit is here right now opening up your eyes, opening up your ears, and opening up your understanding. And do you know why he's doing that? Because he's the great physician and the great I am. And the Spirit of Christ is speaking to your spirit to say to you, today is the day of salvation. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it means you're outside of Christ. And there's no way in the flesh, the Bible says, we can please God. But if you hear the door, the knock on the door of your heart, it's a demonstration that the Holy Spirit is speaking and illuminating and convicting. And today you can be in Christ. Today you can exercise faith in Christ. Three levels of spiritual existence one is having not the spirit there's the second level and is that is this having the holy spirit we read the latter part of verse 9 let's read the first part of verse 9 he said but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you what is he saying he's saying there are new possibilities because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Later on, he'll talk about the Holy Spirit as being the guarantee, if you will, of our salvation. The fact that, that you have the Spirit of God. He seals us unto the day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 4 says. So to have the Holy Spirit means this, that you are in Christ, that you're saved, you're born again, and you have eternity before you, you have heaven as your home. How can you beat that? You cannot. You cannot. It's not just a free gift, and it is that. But it's the greatest gift. It's the greatest gift that humanity has ever uh, received or has been uh, purchased for humanity, and it is that. To have the Holy Spirit of God means that you're born again. That's what, you remember Nicodemus said to John, or rather, uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus wanted to know about the authority of his teaching and the thing that he was doing, and Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. You must be born again. It rocked his world. <laughs> Nicodemus did not understand but again, Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. That's the second level of spiritual existence. But then there's the third level. Number one is if you have not the spirit, you're lost. Number two is if you have the spirit, you're saved. But number three then is if the Holy Spirit has you. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. If the Holy Spirit has you, the Bible says this is what defines spirituality and spiritual maturity. What is this idea of the Holy Spirit having me? It's the idea of filling. It's the idea of yieldedness. It's the idea of being directed by the Holy Spirit. And why would we not want to do that? What is the Holy Spirit going to do? Are we afraid He's going to lead us into something that will be harmful to us? No. If you have, if anything in your consciousness has spoken to that regard about 
what God would do, what the Lord would do, what the Spirit of Christ would do. You need to rebuke that idea because the reality is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is love, joy, peace, and everything that you would want in your life. It's what Jesus said in John 10.10. It's the thief that comes to steal. It is Jesus that paid the ultimate price that we might have life and might have it more abundantly. And by the way, if we have any question about the motivation of God, the motivation of the Lord Jesus, the motivation of the Holy Spirit of God, go forward a little bit in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 where it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, pause there for a moment. Do you remember when you were growing up? At, I don't know if they still do this sort of thing, but kids out on the playground and they're about to have some kind of game time or whatever, and they start choosing up. And you choose based on what you think is the strength or the athletic ability or whatever the game is. You want to pick the people that can help you to win. Is that right? And you know if you get those two or three people, they're like the ace in the hole, as it were. And you know if you get those folks, most likely you're going to be on the winning team. And you want to be on the winning team. Well, the Bible says here that if God is for us, who can be against us? And then notice verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely Give us all things. Now we have four children and eight grandchildren. You've heard that for the very first time. No, no, no. If you're visiting, you've heard it for the very first time. We're blessed. We're so blessed. God has done such a wonderful work and we thank him for it. Uh, but you know, uh, there are times that there were gifts during our life and our family. There are times that there were gifts that I wanted to give my children. And I just couldn't do it. There are times, you know this as parents, there are times you shift things around. <laughs> you make some movements. You make some sacrifices that maybe are very costly, but you do them because you want to give that gift. And you do those things through this life, this journey that is family. And as you do these things, oftentimes the recipient of those things do not understand the sacrifice that's involved. And let me say this to every child that is here, because every one of you were a child at some point. I'll say this to you. It takes a lifetime to understand the value of a parent. And you really don't understand the sacrifices that they made until you get older and older and older. And you look back and you go, oh, oh, that's why they did that. And that's how they did that. And that's how sacrificial it was. The point of verse 32 is, God has given the ultimate sacrifice in his only begotten son. And if he's willing to make that sacrifice, what does it say about his commitment to you relationally? To make sure you're blessed. To make sure you have the spiritual assistance that you need. To make sure that you're not alone, but you have a helper. To make sure that, again, you have that assistance that you need in your Christian life. Consider the importance of of the Holy Spirit in bringing forth new life. Secondly, consider the importance of the Holy Spirit in putting things to death. Notice the contrast again. We've read the contrast in verse 9, but notice verses 10 and 11. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Notice verse 6 now. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then again in verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now let me say, child of God, first of all, this text, Romans chapter 8, speaks of something that positionally happens 
when you're saved, when you place your faith in Christ, something happened. There's the work of God that takes you out of the kingdom of darkness and places you into the kingdom of light. It takes you out of that group that's, that's talked about that is under condemnation and places you into the group that is in Christ Jesus. It's the greatest of contrast and it is the greatest of change in regards to spiritual existence. So something happens positionally and it has eternal ramifications. Having said that, there is an ongoing work that happens in the life of a believer. Paul talked about this. You remember in Philippians 1? He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. Under the day of Christ. There's a finished work that God is going to do. In that day when we see him face to face. 1 Corinthians 13 says. Now we behold in a glass darkly. But then face to face. We are going to be changed in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye. I'm thankful for that change. That transformation. But I read also in God's word. That he intends to bring about change incrementally as we grow in Christ Jesus. And this change is to be practical, it is to be observable, it is to be noticeable by you and by others. It's to be necessary. As we read this, these verses and we think about this idea of putting something to death, you think, well, Pastor, that's a negative idea. Why, would you, why should we be talking about putting things to death? Well, the reality is, that the Bible makes it clear that every human being is born into sin and therefore we are sinners by birth. And I think we all know this. We're also sinners by choice. And what that means is that every part of my being has been affected by the consequence of sin. How deep is this? How, um, how broad is this? How all-encompassing is this? I would say to you, that sin affects us at our very genetic level. <laughs> at our very genetic level. How do we know that? Because we break down. And uh, someone said this morning, they said, Pastor, I, we, don't, we don't heal like we used to. We don't, get, we don't get up as easily we as used to. Somebody said to me the other day that they failed this past week. And they, they said, I think it'll probably be at least three or four weeks before I get over it. And that just happens over time. Uh, there's one philosophy in this world that says we're getting better and better. There's another philosophy that is biblical, a biblical worldview, and it says, no, we're not really getting better. But sort of we're breaking down. Sin's consequence can be observed at the very genetic level. If that were not true, when you go into a new doctor's office and they give you that multi-page questionnaire, have you ever, or has anybody in your family ever, and when I fill those things out, I'm like, what business is this of yours? You're being a little intrusive, you know. But they necessarily have to ask some of those questions. What are they looking for? They're looking for medical history. And they're looking for what has been the case in your family. Do you have a genetic predisposition to this, 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 this? Why would you have those things? Because of the direct result of sin. How, again, all-encompassing that it, it is in every area of the life. It is physical, it is emotional, and yes, it is spiritual. Concerning the physical ramifications of sin and the consequence, God has already promised that the believer will receive one day a new body. I'm thankful for that. Paul talked about it. He said, all of creation groans waiting for redemption, 2 Corinthians 5. He said, and we live in this earthly tabernacle, this earthly tent that will be dissolved, but we have a building with God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Ooh, that's good news. The Bible describes the eternal state of the believer as a place where there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more suffering, There'll be no more Satan, but there will be the Savior. That's heaven, dear friend. Now, the Bible also talks about streets of gold and pearly gates and all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things. But you tell me there's a place where there's an absence of sin, suffering, and Satan, and that Jesus is going to be there? I'll say that's heaven. And I'm looking forward to that place. But this consequence in regards to the physical body God has promised the believer a new body as well as eternal life concerning the emotional and spiritual consequence well 
God has given us, again, the, the promise of eternal life, but he has also given us within his word spiritual principles to give immediate assistance through spiritual transformation with eternal benefits. This is the point of emphasis concerning what it means to be renewed spiritually. Why would the Bible say that to us? And it does say that to us. How often? Many times. Let me give you some references. And I know even though Beth graciously gave me four more minutes this morning, which I'm going to use up, uh, I won't have time to read all of these to you, but Romans 12, 1 and 2 in this same book says to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He tells us in verse 1, present your bodies a living sacrifice. There are some things that can happen to me in this life spiritually if I am willing. And the Bible speaks of a willingness. It speaks of a surrender. It speaks of a yieldedness. And it's good. It's a good thing. We're talking about surrendering to the will of God and to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 4, just write these references down. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 and 17 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. In other words, God is continuing to work. I'm thankful that he's patient with us. I'm thankful that he continues to work in us. And through us, Ephesians 4 says, and be, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And then in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And then he talked about as a result of that, how there is brought into the body unity. As regardless of our backgrounds, we can have fellowship that we're going to talk more about in a moment. And so the Bible speaks of this. It speaks of the ability now as a result of the Holy Spirit of God to put some things to death. What kinds of things is it talking about? And one of those texts did literally say, don't lie to one another, but rather than that, do this. Speak truth to one another. You know, I became vividly aware of the need to change some of my habits when I first got married. Part of that was due to the fact that I was, Stacy and I, married as children. I mean, little bit of children. I was 18 and 16, and we get younger and younger. We look back at that and go, good night. We were infants when we got married and didn't know anything. And I was immediately awakened to the reality that I wasn't dating anymore. I was married to this woman. And now my attitudes were more, had more accountability. I was vividly aware of this. And my attitudes, my actions, my choices, my words, all of these things, it's a whole new set of rules, isn't it? You know what I learned? In order for us to have a peaceful home, there's got to be some change. And let me tell you something. What, this is what happens when two people get married. It's not the Disney version necessarily. Can I get a witness? But what happens is we, we make this commitment, we make this marriage covenant, and lo and behold, we bring our luggage with us. It's just said this way, baggage. You bring your baggage with you. And you know what's in that baggage? All kinds of stuff that, lo and behold, if you're going to make it, if you're going to survive, you're going to have to unpack this stuff. And you're going to find that there, are, you know, you started out with all these areas of wonderful compatibility. And then you began to discover another level of intimacy and knowledge and awareness. And you began, began to find things that, nah, it's not so compatible. You'll have to, in other, in other words, to make things work, you'll have to learn to let some things die. And there's tendencies, as we said, sin has its consequence at our very genetic level. It is both physical, emotional, and spiritual. And what I need is the spiritual eyes and the spiritual awareness to know the difference. What is flesh and what is spirit? What is beneficial to me in the Christian life? And what is tragic? What is, what is, neg what is a negative thing in the Christian life? 
And I, I'm afraid sometimes we confuse those things. We confuse those things. Consider the importance of the Holy Spirit in putting things to death. We've got to move on. The last thing, consider the importance of the Holy Spirit concerning the spiritual capacity of the fellowship. Of the fellowship of believers, of our fellowship with God, our fellowship in Christ. Consider the importance of the Holy Spirit concerning the spiritual capacity of the fellowship. Notice verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That is straightforward, isn't it? In other words, I am demonstrating my witness. I'm manifesting a testimony that I'm in, in fact a saved, a child of God, when I am being led by the Spirit of God. What does that indicate if I'm not being led by the Spirit of God? What does it indicate if I'm being in the flesh, if I'm living in the flesh? You say, well, pastor, you know what? We're all in church. Everybody's got to be spiritual. Oh, really? Not necessarily. I've got to make a choice every day. I'll have to make a choice before I step into this pulpit, the kind of mentality I have, the attitude I have. If I'm not careful, I can bring baggage with me from the past week, and you can too. You can bring it to church with you. And the idea we're just going to have a church building and fill it with a bunch of church people, and it's going to be incredibly spiritual always. That's not necessarily true, is it? In fact, we can, you know, not only can that not be true, that we're not always spiritual, but we can get fleshly and very, very carnal even in a church. It can happen. It can happen. But there's a choice, isn't it? There's a choice in regards to these things. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I'm thinking about Philippians chapter 2. And let me read this, just a verse or two to you from Philippians chapter 2. Hold your place in Romans chapter 8. Philippians chapter 2, Paul said this, verse 1, Therefore, if, any, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, listen to this, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, and then in verse 5 he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And in that text, he demonstrates what that Christ-likeness is. What that spiritual-mindedness that is Christ-likeness. What does it look like? It is unity. It is not conformity. Sometimes we think spirituality is conformity. Spirit, spirituality is not conformity. You can conform about a whole host of things and not be spiritual at all. You know, I've talked a little bit about over the past few weeks, past couple of months, I guess, about our convention, some of the issues that have been going on with our convention. And there is some theological doctrine conformity there, and then there's some that's not conforming, you know, some division there. But the issue that I have seen that is worse than that is the, is the attitude of divisiveness and sort of this political kind of manipulating and maneuvering that is so dishonoring to God. Again, the idea that conformity leads to spirituality, not necessarily the same thing. Look, I know somebody here today that's non-conformant. We've got a non-conformant in our church this morning. And I'm fixing to point him out right now. It's me. You were all scared before I said that. Is he going to point me out? Surely he's not going to do that. Some of you already noticed. I'm not wearing a tie. And I'm not wearing a jacket. Now, there's nothing wrong. I wear a tie. I wear a jacket sometimes. Sometimes I wear a crew neck with a jacket. Sometimes I wear, you know, this shirt right here. You know, to deal with this kind of rebel behavior, we need to go to the text of Scripture that deals with proper Christian dress. Let's turn there. I don't hear any pages turning. All right, this is what we'll do. We'll go and we'll find the text where Jesus is talking about it or maybe where Jesus demonstrates it. Well, if we turn to the text where Jesus is talking about the emphasis of dress, don't worry about your clothes, number one, but then don't be like the Pharisees. Oh, whoa, no. So we can develop a sense of standard, religious standard, that the emphasis of it is conformity. And I'm thankful that's not the spirit and attitude here. Again, I became a little non-conformant for the point and purpose of 
saying this. Conformity is not spirituality. What are, the, what are the prerequisites of fellowship? Let's just talk about this for a moment and then we've got to close. What are the prerequisites for fellowship? What's fundamentally necessary for spiritual fellowship in Christ? It is salvation. It's the agree, agreement on the plan and the person of salvation. In other words, you've got to be in Christ. You've got to believe that Christ is the the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no way to the Father but by Him. There are fundamental things in regards to theology that we've got to agree on to have fellowship, and if we agree on those things, primary things, we can have it. Now, we can disagree on all kinds of secondary things. How do I know this? Because this church is a melting pot. I thought about it this past week. I counted up about five different denominations that are represented in this fellowship of believers and we have the name Baptist Church but we've got all kinds of folks from all kinds of background and I love it I love it I love the fact that we can have a spiritual family a spiritual community because of a number one a relationship with Christ and then an understanding about the principles that govern us you see, we're not conformance. There are all kinds of differences, and I don't even mean doctrinal differences. I'm saying personal differences. I'm looking at my friend Frank Burton. I'm sorry to call you out, brother, but it just came to mind, so here you go. Frank Burton and I, I he is a great hero of our family. Our boys think he is the best thing since sliced bread. And part of the reason why is when we first came here, Frank invited us on a kayak trip down the Tallapoosa, and it's one of the memories of their life. We took this trip down to Tallapoosa and Miss Janice fixed homemade biscuits. And we traveled a little ways down this Tallapoosa and then we stopped and had biscuits and that kind of thing. Just the fellowship, just the welcoming, loving spirit. Uh, when Joshua and Neely came in this morning, uh, first thing Frank did when he saw, he broke all kinds of protocols and went over and hugged both of them. It just can't help it because of the, But, you know, we're in disagreement about some things. I mean, serious disagreement about some things. One, I love purple whole peas. I don't believe Frank would eat purple whole peas. Contrastingly, I have been told that Frank Burton will eat fried rattlesnake. And he just raised his hand in testimony. I ain't a gonna. I'm just telling you. And you say, well, Pastor, that's such a ridiculous, simplified example. Listen to me, dear friend. The fellowship of the Spirit is one of the most precious things that we have as believers. It is our fellowship with the Heavenly Father. And then it's our fellowship with one another. And we have these areas we've got to agree on to be Christian, right? Right? To be able to have these fundamentals, to be able to have basic fellowship. But beyond that, there are spiritual principles that govern our lives. How we relate to one another, even though we disagree on some things. How we relate to one another in the church, the body of Christ. I'm going to close. Well, almost close. I'll say that. I'm going to almost close with reading you this Psalm 133, and most many of you know that this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Psalm 133, and it's just a great passage because it, what it talks about is the atmosphere of blessing. The atmosphere where the Lord is pleased to bless. Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. Now, what is that picture? It's the picture of the anointing of God, this anointing oil. And it's also a symbolic picture of the Holy Spirit. And so this is what's happening. This is a spiritual thing. This is this anointing sort of picture of Aaron as... Uh, as the priest of God. And this anointing oil, again, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, I believe, is there. And what's the context? It's the unity of the brethren. And then what's the consequence of this, this unity, this anointing of the Holy Spirit of God? Verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon 
descending upon the mountains of Zion. For, the, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. Life evermore. Ooh, child of God. That is so good. I will tell you in these days, I believe in these last days. I'm not looking for a perfect church. If I found one, I would ruin it if I ever stepped in the door. But I want to be a real church, don't you? I want to be a real church. I want to be an authentic church that really does emphasize a relationship with Christ that's real and a relationship with one another that's real. Uh, just this final, I guess, illustration. Uh, recently, I received a new phone. You didn't know this, but the church bought me a new phone. The reason was my old phone was so old it was malfunctioning and could not be depended upon. And I heard the complaints of the people uh, about my phone, my old phone. It wouldn't function anymore. And so uh, thank you very much. You didn't even know that, but you as a church bought me a new phone. It's a smartphone. And it's not just a smartphone. It's a smarter smartphone. It's a smarty pants smartphone is what it really is. And I'll just tell you, I, I, look, I, it's a sign of the times. It's a sign of my age. There's so many things, and I get frustrated with it, and I'll have to say, Josh, Jeremiah, or maybe one of the grandchildren to tell me what I can do. And I'm still, it's a long way to go, I'm afraid. And listen, let's, let's think about it. All that's been replaced with this phone, number one, a phone, and then a computer, and then, you know, these boombox radios we used to have, we got all of that there. And then the camera, and then the video recorder, and all kinds of things, calendars, and day planners, and yearly planners, and all those, all this within this little computer. And it is scary what they can do. And so I had that happen to me right at the next week after I received this phone. I had the phone, and uh, I just happened to open up my calendar in the phone. And when I opened it up, it had some things listed on the calendar that I didn't put on the calendar. And I said to Stacy, Stacy, how did this get in here? I did not put this in here. And one of the things that had it had to, the reservations to go to the convention. I was going to go to the convention within these dates. And I said, I did not put that in there. How did it get there? And then the day of the convention, we Pack, got our bags, got out of the house, got in the car, and the phone pulled up the map to the hotel we were going to. And I didn't ask it to do that. How did it do that? And I said to Josh, I said, Josh, this is, this is scary to me. And I, Listen, you also know this, that you can be talking about something, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, advertisement come up. I'm telling you, big brother spying on us. But I asked Josh the other day, I said, son, how did this happen? He said, dad, it's your email. The fact that you linked up your Google email with this, and so it's able to go through that and get these dates and information and just put it on, its ca put it on the calendar. I'm just telling you people, I, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm dating myself, I don't like it. I don't like somebody else being in control of my activities, where I'm going, what I'm doing, and all this kind of stuff, I'm a little concerned about that. And I think for good reason. But there's another kind of control that the Bible talks about. It talks about walking in the Spirit. It talks about living in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, worshiping in the Spirit. It talks about, as we've read this morning, being led by the Holy Spirit of God. And you know what? In that realm, I can absolutely, absolutely give 100% trust because God's got a plan, and Jesus talked all about it, summed it up in this. It's the thief that wants to take from you. But Jesus came that you might have life and might have it more abundantly and then sent his spirit to dwell in you to make it happen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. We're going to have our time of invitation. Has the Lord spoken to your heart today? Maybe about making a commitment to Christ. This is your opportunity to make that public. I think it's a great time. I know this is not in vogue today. It's not popular anymore. 
about coming forward because people feel maybe a little bit embarrassed by that. It's uncomfortable. No question about it. Stepping out of a pew is an uncomfortable thing to do. But any time you feel that emotion, in that moment, think about two things. Number one, it was very uncomfortable for Jesus to live the glories, leave the glories of heaven to come down to this sinful world. It's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable to live in a human body for those 30-some-odd years. Very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable to be betrayed. It was very uncomfortable to be ridiculed. It was very uncomfortable to be, be on trial by somebody else who's the judge who would have no authority if it had not been given to him. It was very uncomfortable to be scourged. It was very uncomfortable to have a thorn on his brow. It was very uncomfortable to be put up on a cross of Calvary to die for your sins and mine. It was very uncomfortable right down to breathing his last breath where he said to tell a sty, paid in full, it is finished. It's very uncomfortable. It's okay for us to take an a, a com uncomfortable step in order to follow the directions of the Holy Spirit of God. And let me say this. I found this to be true. If you take that first step, the Lord just seems to carry you after that. It just seems to help you along. And I just want to encourage you about whatever decision you may have. I do remind you. Hey, here we go. That's exciting, isn't it? And so I just encourage you, fill out that visit card. Let us know of any way that we can help you. We're going to have a time of invitation as Bob is going to lead us now. Play this song. We're so thrilled and blessed to have with us uh, our new friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, Ashley and Natalie and Dalton and Rivers. And uh, we have been just so thoroughly blessed. And the circumstances, how this came about, uh, how Stacy came to know Natalie and they met each other at the Y and then a, a relationship bloomed out of that and Miss Karen Reese was a part of that. And I, and I know others. And by the way, Stacy hasn't left me today. She's over there preparing lunch. We're, we're going to have lunch with these guys afterwards. And so they have come this morning uh, to, uh, to become members of Lake Martin Baptist Church. And Natalie has all, yes, <laughs> praise the Lord. Natalie has, both of them made professions of faith, and Natalie has already been baptized and uh, Brother Ashley is awaiting that. He wants us to do it old-fashioned style. He don't want to get in the tub. So uh, before the waters freeze over on Lake Martin, we're going to try to get that really soon lined up, and we're going to do it the old-fashioned style. We're going down to the creek if we have to. And so, hey, do we have a motion from the audience this morning that we receive this wonderful family into the fellowship of Lake Martin Baptist Church? Everybody in favor? I tell you what, some of you afterwards will want to come down and greet them and just welcome them to the fellowship. But let's everybody give a Lord, the Lord a praise. Amen. 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 We're so glad each and every one of you are here. Again, let us know any way that we can be a blessing to you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that is ours to be here. What a blessing to be in your house today. Thank you for this wonderful family. We ask for your richest blessings upon them and also for everyone that was here today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you folks. Thank you for being here.